All right, I want to read to you uh, from Ezekiel 16 because this is God's, uh, I've titled this uh, message, Israel, My Beloved, because, um, you know, that was a, one of the biggest things I learned over there was about God's love. Um, but uh, this is the story that God tells of how he, he made Israel his bride. So if you have Ezekiel 16, I'm going to read uh, the first eight verses to you. Now, Ezekiel, remember, he's over in Babylon right now. He is left, he is not in the land anymore. He is part of the egg group of exiles who have gone to Babylon, and he's ministering to them there. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity is of the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother a Hittite. And as for your nativity, in the day that you were born, your navel was not cut, your umbilical cord, neither were you washed in water to supple you. You were not salted at all, nor were you swaddled at all. None I pitied you to do any of these unto you, to have compassion upon you. But you were cast out in the open field to the loathing of your person in the day that you were born. But when I passed by you, and I saw you polluted there, dying in your own blood, I said unto you when you were in your blood, live. Yea, I said unto you when you were in your blood, live. And I have caused you to multiply as the bud of the field. And you have increased and waxed great. And you are come to, uh, you, you are come to excellent ornaments. Your breasts are fashioned and your hair is grown, whereas you were naked and bare. Now when I passed by you and I looked upon you, behold, your time was the time of love. And so I spread my skirt over you and I covered your nakedness. Yea, I swore unto you, and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord, and you became mine. I mean, the Lord tells the story. Now, he goes on, and he tells the story of how they left, her, they left him. And, and, you know, it's a sad story in the sense that that's why God had to judge them. So he's saying God caused Israel to know her abominations. So the, the idea, though, is the Lord tells him first the story of, 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 his, of their love, of how he found them. And no one wanted them, but he found them, and he took them to himself, made them beautiful, and they became his, you know? This idea of God being Israel's husband and, and they being his wife. You know, this relationship, intimate relationship he had with Israel, his beloved. And so as, as we go through this tonight, you know, my hope is that, that you'll be blessed uh, and see God's love for his people and his faithfulness towards his people, even though they've been unfaithful, and as such, his faithfulness to us. So three things I want to I talk about tonight. Um, I want to talk about, number one, how the rebirth of the nation of Israel fulfills prophecy. This is, you know, something that is important. If you, you know, when you go on a trip like this, and, and, and I'm going to share some things with you from Scripture of, of fulfilled prophecy. So how the rebirth of the nation of Israel fulfills prophecy. Secondly, I want to tell you and share through some things I learned how God has a proven track record of fulfilling prophecy. And then lastly, I want to, I want to share with you some of the personal things that, that I applied to my life from going to Israel and encourage you to come as well because we're going next March. So amen. Amen. So Israel, my beloved, a light to the world in times of faith and in unbelief, because even though they're there right now, majority wise in unbelief, they're still a light to the world because of the fact that they're fulfilling prophecy. So uh, history, something I heard over there, which I thought was really cool. History is only facts. Prophecy gives us the right philosophy of that history. Isn't that cool? Prophecy gives us the right way to look at those facts. It gives us the right understanding of those facts. It gives meaning to those facts. And the fact is, is that Israel was told by God that if they sinned against him, they would be cast out of the land. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Can everyone see their Bibles real well? Or do we need to turn the lights back on? Good? Okay. All right, Deuteronomy 28. I'm good. I just don't want to make sure everybody else could see. Deuteronomy 28. And I'm going to read the last few verses of the chapter, verses 64 through 68. Actually, let's look at verse 63. We'll start there. This is if they sin and rebel against the Lord. It's right before Moses is about to die. They're about to go into the promised land, and God is reminding them to be faithful and to keep his covenant. And so here in verse 28, or verse 63 of chapter 28, he says, And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to nothing. And you shall be plucked from off the land where you go to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter you among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. 
And there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, even of wood and stone. And among these nations shall you find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot have rest. But the Lord shall give you there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And in your life it shall hang in doubt before you, and you shall fear day and night, and you shall have none assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, Oh, would God it were evening. And in the evening you shall say, Oh, would God it were morning. There'll be no escape. For the fear of your heart wherewith you shall fear, and for the sight of your eyes which you shall see. And so the Lord shall bring you into Egypt again with ships. The idea is back into bondage again. By the way whereof I spoke unto you, and you shall see it no more again, and there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwoman, and no man shall buy you. I mean, that's a heavy pronouncement that if they will turn to idols, that God is going to cast them out of the land. I remember he hasn't even brought them into the land yet. But he says, if you go in there and you commit idolatry and you turn away from me, I'm going to kick you out of the land and scatter you all over the world. Now, we know when Israel went into the land that what happened? They were unfaithful. And God brought them under the power of their enemies until eventually it got so bad that in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, in the days of uh, the king of Assyria, the northern kingdom fell. And in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, the southern kingdom fell. And Israel was taken away from their land. Now, we know that years later, they came back into the land, right? Under uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest and Ezra, the, Ezra the, the scribe. And of course, Nehemiah later came and he helped rebuild the wall. And so in Jesus' day, we find them back in the land again because of something Deuteronomy chapter 4 says. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 27 through 31. We find very similar language, but it has a different ending. Deuteronomy 4, verse 27, And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, where the Lord shall lead you. And there you shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. In other words, you wanted these idols? Well, I'll show you how useless they are. You'll go serve them, and, and you know, I won't hear And there he says, but, verse 29, but if from thence you shall seek the Lord your God, you shall find him. And if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. So when you are in tribulation and all these things are come upon you, even in the what days? Latter days, if you shall turn to the Lord your God and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God, he will not forsake you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swear unto them. And so he will bring them back into the land, the scriptures teach. And so the Lord says, if you'll turn back to me, I'll bring you back. And that's what they did. They turned back to the Lord. The Lord brought them out of Babylon, brought them back home. But then what happens? Years go by and they fall into religious legalism. They don't fall into idolatry of worshiping to idols now, but now they fall into a religious idolatry, the idolatry of their self-righteousness. And so Jesus comes and he starts shaking that up. And what do they do? They crucify their own Messiah. And so we find that not 40 years later, the Romans come in and they level Jerusalem. They you know, destroy the Temple Mount and they scatter the diaspora, we call it. They scatter the Jewish people all throughout the Roman Empire. And for almost 2,000 years, the Jewish people are wandering, just like God says, in foreign lands. One more scripture, Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32. And we know this doesn't just apply to Babylon coming back from there because the Bible said in the latter days this will be true too. Jeremiah 32, verses 37 through 34. You've got Isaiah and then Jeremiah. Two pretty big books. So if you can find one, you can find the other. Jeremiah 32, verses 37 through uh, 44. Actually, let's start in verse 36. This is Jeremiah. He's speaking to his people. He's been speaking judgment. You're going to go into Babylon. But now the Lord gives him a promise here. Verse 36. And now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, Jerusalem, whereof you say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of Babylon. 
I will gather them out of all countries whither I have driven them in my anger and in my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them again unto this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will plant them in this land assuredly, or permanently, it says. The idea there of assuredly means I will fix them there with my whole heart and with my whole soul. That didn't happen when they came back from Babylon because we know when Rome came, they got kicked back out again. So this has not fully been fulfilled. I mean, it was not fully fulfilled in coming back from Babylon. For thus says the Lord, like as I brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring them upon them all the good that I have promised them. And the field shall be brought in this land, whereof you say it is desolate without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money, and they'll subscribe evidences, and seal them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin, and in the places around Jerusalem, and the cities of Judah, and in the cities of the mountains, and the cities of the valley, and the cities of the south, for I will cause their captivity to return, says the Lord. So he has promised that he's going to do all these things, okay? Now, we fast forward to the 19th century. Theodor Herzl, who is an Austrian-Hungarian journalist, is usually credited with being the engineer behind the, the Zionist movement. That's the movement to, for Jewish people to return back to their homeland. He published a book called The Jewish State in 1897. He argued that the Jewish people would never escape the anti-Semitism in the world until they joined the family of nations by legally obtaining their own land. But even prior to that, God had started to put the idea of a return into the Jewish people's hearts in the 1880s. Within five years of 1881, 25,000 Jews had migrated back to their homeland to start 20 settlements. Now, because most of their early immigrants came from Eastern Europe, they brought socialistic ideas with them. So this led to the formation of the kibbutz. And then if you go to Israel with us next March, the very first hotel we'll stay in is a kibbutz. It's a communal living area where people farm the land and whatnot. They have sales, booths, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and then they have a hotel. And, and it's all, everybody shares everything equal in common. It's the last holdovers of those days. Uh, you have kibbutzes all over the place, and they're very proud to share their history with you, that they were the first ones here, and they, have, they keep very good records of their ties going back to when they came in the 18, late 1800s or early 1900s. Um, so this led to the formation of the kibbutz, farming communities where everyone worked uh, the land and split the proceeds equally. Now, the modern generation, which is used to it, by the way, when Israel first became a nation, they were a, a socialistic, communistic nation. That has changed. They're now democratic and very much capitalistic. Uh, so what's funny is the kibbutz, all the young people come up, they're like, I don't want, I want to make money. And so then none of them work anymore. So they go and find another job. So now the kibbutzes have to hire Arabs to work for them because none of their own people will work for them, which is interesting. So um, now over the next 30 years from the late 1800s, those numbers would increase to 250,000 Jewish people living in Israel. During this time, Israel was under the control of the Ottoman Empire. Now, after the defeat and dissolution of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, those lands were sp split between the French and the English. And in 1920, the League of Nations endorsed something called the British Mandate. Britain's proposal was to give the land east of the Jordan River to establish an Arab state, the what became the country of Jordan, and the land west of the Jordan River to establish a Jewish state, which would become Israel. By 1939, over 450,000 Jews had returned to Israel. It's crazy. It's funny because when you hear, and, and, and I'm not anti-Arab, okay, because Jesus loves those people too. But when you hear people talk about that being the land of Palestine, the reason it's called the land of Palestine is because Emperor Hadrian hated the Jewish people and he wanted to wipe out all memory of it. So he renamed the place the land of the Philistines. That's what Palestine means. It means the land of the Philistines, Israel's hated enemies. There were no Philistines in existence at that time, but he called it that because you know that they were the hated enemies of the Jewish people. So there's no such thing as a Palestinian unless you actually go back to and say you're a Philistine, okay? But all the Philistines were wiped out by, the, by Nebuchadnezzar in fulfillment of prophecy, which I'm not going to get into that tonight because that's a whole different story. But 450,000 Jewish people moved back to Israel between 1881 and 1939. That number jumped, jumped to 650,000 by the end of World War II. 
And so in 1947, two years after the war ended, Britain announced its intention to withdraw from the Middle East and to make good on the British mandate. On November 29th of that year, 1947, the United Nations approved the formation of an Israeli state. And on May 14th, 1948, the leaders of the Jewish community declared their independence. Israel was once again a nation as God had promised. I mean, that's crazy when you think about it. There is no Philistia, Philistia anymore. There is no land of the Phoenicians anymore. There are no Edomites anymore. There's no nation of that anymore. And yet here a nation that had been gone from the face of humanity for 1900 years is now a nation again as God prophesied. Do you know what's interesting? People mocked pastors who said Israel would become a nation again. They mocked them in the 1800s. And it wasn't just what, you know, 100 years later, Israel was a nation in fulfillment of what exactly God said. Now, if you're wondering, they're going, yeah, but well, why is this a good thing? They don't believe in Jesus for the most part. They're still in unbelief. Well, here's the cool thing. The Bible predicts that too. Turn to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. God had said that when they come back into the land that he would do them good and they would be his people and they would, he'd make a new covenant with them, but they haven't gotten there yet. And Ezekiel 37 explains that that's how it will be. And this is the prophecy of the valley of the dry bones. Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39 are all prophecies of things that will take place in the latter days. 38 and 39 haven't happened yet. They could happen at any moment. But 37, at least most of it, has already been fulfilled. Now, verse 1 of chapter 37 says, Now the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and it set me down, set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Now, I'm not a big, like, graveyard fan. I'm certainly not a big bone fan. Um, so I don't know what I would feel like being set down in a big valley full of bones. But he caused me, told Ezekiel, you can't just be here. I want you to pass by them round about. I want you to go all around this valley of bones. And so, behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. There was no blood in them, nothing. These are dead, dry bones. They've been dead for a long time. And he said unto me, the Spirit of God said unto him, um, the, hand of the, Lord, uh, the Lord said to him, Son of man, can these bones live? Now, he knows, he has an idea of what's going on here, the idea of Israel being reborn as a nation again. And Ezekiel's going, Lord, looking at it right now, I, I don't know, but you know. He says, Lord, you know. Well, again, he said unto me, okay, I want you to prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, oh, you dry bones. Can you imagine preaching that sermon? I preached to some old folks before, but not bones. So. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. That's your sermon, Ezekiel. At least it's short. And so I prophesied as I was commanded. But here's what happened. As I started to prophesy to these bones, preach to these bones, there was a noise. Behold, a shaking, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. The bones start coming back together. So skeletons start to form. And while I watched, lo, the sinews and the flesh, it came upon them, and the skin covered them above. But what does it say? There was no breath in them. So he's watching, and all of a sudden, I mean, this is like, you know, a night of the living dead, but like, you know, real. And, and it's, it's, all of a sudden, the bones are coming together, and he's seeing skeletons, and then skin started coming upon them. But there's no life into them. There's no breath. They're not breathing. It's just these husks. These, they're flesh. They're bones there, but they're not alive yet. And then he said unto me, so now there's, there's another stage. Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto them, into them and lived and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. And here's the explanation. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. 
Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and I will cause you to come out of your graves and bring you in graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. So that's the first stage when they'll know that he's the Lord. They'll know that this is God's doing. It's so fascinating because many of the Jewish people over there are are very secular. They celebrate the feasts and whatnot, but they don't necessarily have a whole lot of devotion in their faith. But, you know, when, they, when you talk to them about the idea of Israel being a nation again, they're very pro-Israel, unless you're Orthodox. If you're Orthodox, you are very, again, not pro-Israel. They are always protesting. They, they believe that it was a mistake to become a nation again because they, they believe that you're just doing what you did when Rome destroyed us back then. We tried to throw off the Roman yoke, and, and we got wiped out, and God destroyed us, and now we're going to try to do it in our own strength again, and God's going to destroy us again. We shouldn't be a nation until our Messiah comes back. So it'll be fascinating when the Antichrist comes around and they rally behind him because they don't rally behind their nation now, but they'll think he's their Messiah. But the second stage will be, and I shall put my spirit in you and shall live, and I shall place you on your own land, and then shall you know that I am the Lord that has spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So Israel's going to have two stages. They'll return physically first in unbelief, and then the spiritual return will happen when Jesus comes back and, and the spirit of God comes into them. So a beautiful, wonderful prophecies in the scripture about the Jews coming into their land again, and it happened in 1948. And when you go over there, you can't help but look around and think to yourself, my goodness, I am walking in the fulfilled scripture. I'm living in fulfilled scripture. The second thing that's fascinating when you go over there is the scriptures not just prophesy that Israel will return to their land, but they prophesy a physical revival of the land. Mark Twain visited Israel in the 1860s, and he wrote about it in his book, Innocence Abroad. He reported that Israel was a barren wasteland with no trees. He said it's it's just a big, barren wasteland with no trees. According to one report today in Israel, there are over 400 million trees, and rainfall has increased over 450% since the beginning of the century. That doesn't happen anywhere. (laughs) Rain doesn't increase 450%. It either just rains or it doesn't. 450%? Under the Ottoman Turks and their heavy taxes, see the inhabitants of the area of Israel, they fled to the hills. They abandoned the valleys uh, to, to grow unchecked. And so by the time, the, and, and they didn't sell any of, the, uh, any of the good land up in the mountains to the Israelis when they started immigrating there in the 1880s. They said, you can have the valleys. Well, when they immigrated to the valleys, uh, it was all swampland. Prior to 1948, numerous historians described the now lush valleys of Israel as mosquito-infested swamps. Those are the lands that the kibbutz were formed in. Very hard lives, very difficult lives to eke out in existence, and yet they persevered. You know what is in Israel to now, today? Today, Israel is a major exporter, not just producer, but exporter. They're the third leading exporter of grain in the world exporter. They don't import food. All of their food is supplied by themselves. Today, Israel is a major exporter of fresh produce and a world leader in agricultural technologies, despite the fact that the geography of Israel is not naturally conducive to agriculture. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures. There's quite a few. This is Israel from top to bottom. It's from the start of my trip to the end of my trip. So this is the road to Caesarea by the sea. This is where Paul had his trial when he, when he was arrested and he spoke before Herod and Herod said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. So this is the road to Caesarea. Does that look like a barren wasteland? Does it look like swamp? Look at it. It's all green. It's everywhere. These are the pictures I took all along the way. Now we're driving back to Galilee. So this is the other side of the road. There we go. I mean, look at that. There's lots of rocks. Our poor guide said, the one, one thing we never have any shortage of in Israel is rocks. God has blessed us with rocks. And there are. There are rocks everywhere. There's no place where you can't find rocks. So look at all those fields. That's the road to Megiddo. Look at the Megiddo Valley. This is taken from Tel Megiddo, so the ruined city of Megiddo that they've dug up from, from not the top, but I'm kind of from the lower part. But that's the Valley of Megiddo. It'll be filled to the uh, horses' bridles with blood after Armageddon. So it won't look so green. From there, you go back to Galilee, and this is a drive up to Mount Arbel. We're going up a mountain. It should be rocky and nasty and yucky. Look at all the green there. They're, these are all fields. Look at this is a view of Galilee from the Mount of Beatitudes. 
The road to, so now we're going all the way up north to the border of Lebanon. This is Dan. I mean, this is a place, if you could step over, not even five steps into Lebanon, it's brown. So I know I'm, I'm doing overkill here, but this is the road to Gideon Springs, the place where Gideon's army lapped the water up. Um, this is, now we're moving south. We're going into the Jordan Valley, and I think those are sheep. So I think that's a shepherd. Those are mustard seeds, by, uh, bushes, by the way, there. Um, so this is the Jordan Valley. More of the, look at all those, the, the irrigation, Jordan Valley. Now we're coming to the border with Jordan. Now I'm going to point this out up here because it's kind of interesting. If you can barely see, but like the little road right there, that is Jordan over here. This is Israel. That's Jordan. Um, so the country of Jordan, that's the road where the army kind of keeps an eye on the border. Now this is, you're leaving Israel. This is the border crossing to the West Bank. This is the South Jordan Valley in the West Bank. The West Bank, now we're about to come right back into Israel, but we're still on the West Bank. That's the wall that they separates East Jerusalem from West Jerusalem, and they put that there so that they're, they're safe. I remember we talked about in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it says Israel won't be a place with walls. So that has to come down eventually for prophecy to be fulfilled. It will come down eventually. But right now they keep it there for safety. So, but you see how brown it is. So I'm, we're about to enter into Jerusalem. We're still in the West Bank, it's brown. West Bank Wall. Now we're back to Jerusalem. Wow. I, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, you know? I mean, this is, this is prophecy. You, wa you walk in the midst of it. So, oh, those are Roman toilets. I'll explain that in a minute. No, that's okay. <laughs> Turn to Amos chapter 9. I got, I got two more scriptures that show that this is fulfilled prophecy, that the land of Israel is blooming. Amos chapter 9. Somewhere after Ezekiel, if you're still there. Isn't that crazy, the difference? Yeah. <laughs> I remember we, we literally came to the border patrol and the West Bank soldiers are there and they're checking us through and you cross over and you, and you just kind of look at each other and you go, it's brown everywhere. Why is it brown everywhere? That's not, it's not Israeli land. Isaiah chapter, or uh, Amos chapter 9, verses 8 through 15. <clears throat> Behold... Verse 8, Amos chapter 9. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, and yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. So in other words, the land's going to be barren. I'm going to judge Israel after I take them out of the land. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, oh, the evil will not ever take nor, nor, uh, nor uh, confront us. But in that day, and he's referring to the end times, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen, and I will close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, says the Lord that does this. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that sows seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them and I will plant them upon their land and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, says the Lord their God. That could not have been fulfilled when they came back from Babylon because they went back out of the land again. This has to refer to their return in the end times. And so we see that fruitfulness. Look at Isaiah 27 verse 6. Isaiah 27 verse 6. Referring to the hope that Israel will have that they'll return to their land someday. He says in Isaiah 27, verse 6, And he shall cause them that come from Jacob to take root, and Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. That's what it says. You know, it's funny because, you know, these days we send our 
agricultural scientists to Israel to learn how to do it. I mean, God has just given them ingenuity. He's given them new techniques. Some of the stuff they showed us over there, they use. It, it's, it's pro- the only way is it could be is God. It's prophecy. So God is faithful. So, so those are two specific prophecies that you walk in every time, anytime you step foot in Israel. You go there and you just see it. You're like, I'm here. I'm living in and walking in fulfillment of prophecy. Now, how does God have a proven track record of fulfilling prophecy? Um, well, before I get to that, I want to explain this pick a little bit. So, picture. Have you ever wondered why people shake with their right hand? Do you want to know why? I didn't know this. So, the way these work, this is actually the gate, the entrance to the Hippodrome, which is basically the chariot races where they would take place, so the stadium. And the gate is where you would do your business. So they wore long robes, so it was, you're not exposed, and you would sit there, and you would do your business, and they would have little hay piles over to, to your, your left, okay, uh, and right. And you would, with your left, you'd take the hay, and that's how you would use the toilet paper. That's kind of what it'd be. And, and then you, that's why you would never shake somebody with your left hand. You'd only use your right hand. So isn't that interesting? So, you know, don't shake hands with left hand. So in, in Israel to this day, to this very day, if you shake somebody with your left hand, they get offended this very day. So anyway, I, there's lots of toilets when you see in ruins. And so I thought I'd show a picture of one, but uh, I'll leave it there. So a couple of prophecies that God uh, uh, has a proof shown, he has a proven track record of fulfilling prophecy. One of them is the fact that Jesus would come to Galilee. Turn to Isaiah chapter nine. I want to share something really cool with you afterwards. Isaiah chapter nine. And these are famous verses, verses we usually talk about during Christmas. Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2. This is, again, they're going to experience judgment. They're going to be cast out of their land. But the Lord says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Those are two tribes that lived in the area of Galilee. And afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Well, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. Why? Verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This next picture, so they discovered this in the city of Capernaum. That was Jesus' hometown, his home base, okay? The little circular area there is a home. Homes were very small back then. Um, that's a home in there. It's, it's a little bit bigger than it looks just from this picture here. Um, it was gr- outside, it was grown to become larger, this outside area, because eventually it was turned into a church. They found the church, it's from the second century, second or third century, but what they realized is when they found the implements from inside that it had been a house beforehand, and they found inscriptions all over the place, and it said the house of Peter and Jesus. Now, you might be saying, what do you mean, and Jesus? Well, that's where Peter, that's where Jesus lived. That's Jesus' house right there. I was, you know, they have bars. You can't go in there and like, you know, jump all over it and stuff. But, you know, uh, but just to be there, I think Jesus lived right there. Now, the cool part is the Sea of Galilee, when you see the sunlight coming through, that's because there's a beach right over there. So remember when Jesus told uh, Peter, Peter came in and said, you know, we pay the temple tax, right? And Jesus, of course, said no. But I'll tell you what, so you don't get embarrassed, Peter. He said, why don't you go out fishing and catch two, the first fish you catch, I'll have two coins, one for you, one for me. It's not even a, a minute walk. And he goes out and he goes fishing, catches the fish, goes and pays the temple tax. John chapter 6, this was a touching moment for me. This is a synagogue in Capernaum. This is not the synagogue that Jesus would have taught in exactly because this is a synagogue from the 5th century that was rebuilt over a destroyed synagogue. But you can see they have little shots where they've dug up and you can see the actual synagogue floor where Jesus would have gone. Now, what's really cool about this, do you remember in John chapter 6 when Jesus says, I am the bread of life? 
you know, and remember the people, they, they all come into him and he said, you know, you, you can't be my, my disciple unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then many left him. And then the disciple said to him, you know, master, he said to them, will you leave too? And what did Peter say? Lord, who else will we go to? You alone have the words of eternal life. I never saw this before, but in John chapter six, it says, and these things were done in the synagogue of Capernaum. Those words were spoken right there. That's where Peter made the statement, where else are we gonna go, Lord? To you alone, you know, uh, you alone have the words of eternal life. You know, so, I mean, that was a real cool moment for me to be there because that verse is very special to me. Um, another prophecy that was fulfilled was the crucifixion. Jesus prophesied of his crucifixion. Um, uh, in Psalm 22, uh, it prophesied of, of the crucifixion. Daniel chapter 9 says the Messiah will be pierced. And Jesus said that if I be lifted up, I'll be drawn to all men. And he was referring to his death, his crucifixion. This is Golgotha now. And you can see the, this is the place of the skull. Um, many of you probably th uh, have wondered, you know, I thought Jesus was crucified on the top. They never, Romans never crucified anybody on top of hills. They crucified on the roadside where people could walk by and see them. So Jesus was actually crucified down below. There's a bus depot there now, which is why I don't have a picture of it. Um, but this is Golgotha right now. You see the two eye holes, and then that's the, what's left of the nose. The nose fell off about two or three years ago. So this is how it used to look back about 75 years ago. And you can see everything. You can see the nose. You can see the mouth. That's where Jesus was crucified right here. So uh, that was fulfilled. So you, um, you walk and you see it right there, the place of the skull. This is where Jesus was crucified. Jesus' resurrection. So uh, in John chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, I'm just going to read it to you. After Jesus turned over all the money changers tables, and we got to see the money changers booths too. Um, they're at the bottom of the temple, and they're empty now. Uh, so no one's doing that anymore. They, they've all moved to different places. But in John chapter 2, when they came to Jesus and they said, by what authority do you do this? And Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and I, in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building, and you're going to rear it up in just three days? But John says he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had said. So this was one of the last places we went to, but this is the garden tomb. While we're not positive that this is Jesus' tomb, it makes sense. It fulfills all the criteria. And when you go there, they walk you through it. They walk you through. For example, the little groove here is where the stone would have been laid, right down here. They found the little, see the stone, looks like a stone container up in the corner up there. That's where they would have put all the embalming stuff and everything like that. And you go inside, it's a, you can tell it's a small tomb. It was you know, for Joseph of Arimathea. It's a vineyard. It would have been owned by a wealthy man. Um, and so uh, this thing, by its proximity to where the scriptures describe the place of Jesus' tomb, it fits, it fits all the criteria. And so uh, Jesus said, I, I'm not going to stay in the grave. I'm going to rise again three days later. And that's the, what the door says now. He is not here. He is risen. I tell you, it's pretty cool to go in and look at the, at the empty tomb. And just, you know, it, you walk out and you go, he's not there. You know, he's risen. He's living in my heart, you know. But one other thing I want to show you about fulfilled prophecy, um, and that's the destruction of the temple. In Matthew chapter 24, and verses 1 and 2, the disciples came to Jesus and they said to him, look at all the awesome buildings of the temple, Lord. And Jesus said to them, see, <laughs> see you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. It's fascinating to use the phrase thrown down. Do you see all these dents? In the, this is the, the street Jesus walked on. When you would go to the temple, this is the, this is the west wall, but it's the south side of the Temple Mount. You would walk up these streets and those little walls on the, on the left side there, those are the money changers' booths. So you would go through there and then you would climb up to the Temple Mount from up there and then you would exit on the south side. I'll show you, I don't think I have any pictures of the south side because uh, they were in the slideshow. If you want to hang around later, I'll go through every pick in the slideshow, but we got to get our kids eventually. So if you want to hang out, I'll do that. Ken's offered to stay and uh, hit pause on the slideshow while I explain it. So if you want to do that, I can do that. Um, but do you see the dents in the ground? That's where the Romans, they were trying, the reason they pried the stones off of each other is because they were, they were uh, covered in gold. And as the fire was, they laid, set fire to the temple mount, um, the gold started to melt and they were trying to get at it. And so they would they took every single stone and they threw them off the Temple Mount and they landed here. So these are the actual stones that Jesus, some of these that Jesus said would be thrown down. And you see them right there. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, not crazy. It's cool. 
Now, since God has a proven track record of fulfilling prophecy, that means I can trust him to fulfill the rest of prophecy too. And I've got two other prophecies I'm going to share with you that haven't been completed yet, but yet are, are, are really cool. So um, this is a fascinating video. Can you go ahead and play it, Justin? It doesn't look like it's going on its own. Let's see if it'll work. Guess where I am right now? Yeah. I'm on I'm in Megiddo. And that's what we saw. I want to read you Revelation 19. I'm going to read Revelation 16 first. You can go to Revelation 19, but I'm going to read 16. I told him, I said, I am not part of the army. You are not getting any of my flesh. So these are the early birds. But Revelation 16, 12 says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial, his bowl, upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keep his, keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And God, he, God, gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Har Megiddon, or the Valley of Megiddo. So there I am on Tel Megiddo, and we're just listening to the Bible studies and stuff. And all of a sudden I look up and I see these storks flying over Megiddo. And I, I just, so you can see, I'm moving out the camera. I got to get it before they fly away, you know? And, and so in Revelation 19, verses 17 and 18, it says this. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. That's a big angel. And he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and, and, and slave, both small and great. Um, like I said, these guys are here early. They wanted to get front row seats. They are ready to eat. So one other prophecy. And why don't you turn to Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one. Now, this is a little different than the view Jesus would have had from the top of Mount Olives. But Jesus has just spoken to the disciples and told them to wait for the promise of the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit, before they go out and be his witnesses. In verse 9, we know he ascends into heaven. It says, and when he had spoken these things, when, while they beheld, they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So they're on this where I'm standing, maybe not exactly, but the general area where I'm standing. They're there and they're watching Jesus go up into the sky. And then the clouds, he disappears into the clouds. And while they're looking steadfastly toward the heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, two angels, which also said, you men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. I was standing on the place that I am going to return someday with my Savior to rule and reign with him. You know, that's, I was standing in that place where I'm going to return. Now, it won't stay that way because the moment his foot hits that, that, that spot, now, it's going to crack in half. And the Bible says it's going to create this fountain and that's going to come right out of Jerusalem and it's going to clear up the Dead Sea and, and everything will be changed there in Israel after that. But, but for now, that's what it looks like. So this is the Mount of Olives view um, of east toward Jerusalem. That's the Dome of the Rock right there. Um, we couldn't go up on the Temple Mount because they weren't allowing anybody up there. What's fascinating is that all these, this area here, it's the Valley Kidron, but these are all tombs. They're all Jewish tombs now. In fact, uh, they believe, and they actually bury them with their feet up first because they believe that they'll rise from the dead when their Messiah comes back on Mount Olives. So Barbara Streisand actually has a tomb already prepaid for right where I'm standing. 
So I'm standing because the wealthy people get closest to the top because you want to be closest to the Messiah when he comes back. So, um, yeah, and they bury him, their heads down in the valley. So the idea is they'll get up and they'll see the Messiah. So that, that's the, where all the Jewish tombs are. So it's a little different than it would have been much greener and much more trees uh, during Jesus's day. It would have been a whole olives everywhere, olive trees everywhere. So, and that's the view of the Mount of Olives toward the north side of Jerusalem, a little bit more green down there in the, in the, in the valley, the Kidron Valley. There's multiple valleys all around Jerusalem. It's a, it's just a gorgeous sight. So, so anyway, lots of prophecy, you know, that we can see fulfilled in scripture and some that it hasn't happened yet, but will be fulfilled. Um, but what I learned most from going to Israel, so the last thing I want to share with you tonight is a couple things about what I learned when I, I went there, the things that God ministered to me. And uh, the first thing that really God ministered to me was his love for me. And I want to share a story with you from the scriptures in Matthew 14. It was really powerful to me. Hopefully it's powerful to you as well. Um, I really feel like it changed my life. It wasn't necessarily anything new teaching, but just the perspective was pretty powerful. Now this is our, probably our third day, I think in Galilee, maybe uh, day one we were in Joppa, day two is Caesarea, Mount Carmel, so this is day three. We'd just been to Megiddo, so I've come back from seeing the storks, told them, sorry, we're leaving, you can't have any of my flesh. And we drive up to here, and Mount Arbel is just gorgeous, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a, uh, you can see all of the Galilee region every direction from here. And uh, that's the Sea of Galilee right there, that down there are the cities that would have been around Galilee. Our hotel is, I think our hotel is yeah, it's right, right around here. We're seeing that boat go out. That's a dock right there. That's where our hotel is. Um, the city of Magdala is actually, oh, let me go to the other. The city of Magdala is somewhere down here. That's the Valley of the Doves. That's what they call it the Jesus Trail because that's the, the track Jesus took to go to all of Galilee. So he, he walked back and forth through there the whole time. It was the major thoroughfare that they would go. It's beautiful. I mean, this is a site from there. Um, again, that's the site south. That's the city of Tiberias, a modern-day Arab city there. We had a Bible study up there. It was just gorgeous. So oh, I'll get to Magdala in a second. Um, so there we are having this Bible study, and it's in uh, Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to read it, and then I'll make a few comments about just the things that God ministered to me. It says, Now immediately Jesus constrained his disciples, verse 22, Matthew 14, to get into a ship and to go before him into the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Pause. So that's the night's going. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. They had a, one lightning storm came down on the Sea of Galilee that night. And I tell you, everybody headed inside because those storms come down. They're very violent. They come down the Hula Valley, where they come, which is the northern part where Lebanon uh, goes to Lebanon. It, it, it acts almost like a, like a slingshot because uh, the winds come down off Mount Hermon and then they just, shoo, they, 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 they come like through a funnel down there and then they just disperse into the Sea of Galilee. And it's, it was it was pretty scary, so I, I stayed in my room under my covers. Because um, the lightning, it's really bad, too. So, what'd you say? Yeah, go back aside? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah, so this is, that's the sea right there, the Sea of Galilee. So, and it comes right down. You can't, see, it was a hazy day. They had these things called camsims, uh, which are these dust storms that come in. And we had one on our, the beginning of our trip. So, you couldn't see far on some of these. So, you can't see the Hula Valley from there, but it's up north. Um, so, this storm comes down there, and the disciples are in the middle of it, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Verse 25, and in the fourth watch, this is between 6 and 3 a.m., uh, uh, 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a spirit, literally an, an evil spirit. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered these words. He says, don't worry, it's me. He answers those words and says, Lord, if it's you, bid me come unto you on the water. So Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind that was boisterous, he was afraid. And he beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, of a truth, you are the son of God. So Jesus comes out to them. And there's a couple things here. You know, Jesus sent them. He gave them a job to do. Go to the other side of the sea. 
And they'd gone as far as they could go in their own strength. They had tried everything they could, but they could not succeed in the task Jesus gave to them. To go any further, Jesus would have to help them. And yet what's crazy is when he gets there to help them, they continue to fail. They were failing at that point, but then Jesus comes to help and they continue to fail. First off, they accuse him of being an evil spirit. He says, no, don't worry, I'm not an evil spirit, it's just me. Be of good cheer. But then Peter still didn't believe it was him and demanded a miracle to prove it was him. And then when Peter's experiencing the miracle, he gets his eyes off the Lord and back on his inability and begins to sink. Now, there's an entire Bible study here on trusting the Lord instead of my own ability. All they'd done is fail, fail, fail. But when Peter started responding to Jesus, he stepped into the supernatural and there was success. I can't do that tonight. We'll do that some other time. But what mostly spoke to me is Jesus' response to all their failure, his great love for these men who didn't get anything right this night. See, he didn't see them struggling to the mountain and say, can't they do anything right? I mean, they're fishermen. This is what they do for a living. I I mean, if there's anything they should be able to do, it's, it's get a boat across the sea. No, instead he came to their aid. And when they accused him of being an evil spirit, Jesus didn't rebuke them there either. He didn't go, jokers, it's me. You know, he didn't say any of that. He said, be of good cheer. Cheer up. It's okay. It's high. Be not afraid. You know, he immediately stops the fear and the condemnation. He's not angry one bit. And when Peter questions it, if it's him, you know, I know what I would have done at that point and be like, really, I'm walking on the water. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back and pray to my dad. He's nicer than you are, you know? No mention of it at all. No critique of Peter. Jesus doesn't blast him. Instead, he actually invites him. He says, come. You want to walk in the water with me? Come. He invites him to come on the water. And then when Peter starts to sink. You say, well, here Jesus got frustrated. He said, oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt? But you know what? Jesus wasn't bothered because Peter got his eyes on the waves. He was saddened because Peter thought Jesus would let him sink. And you know, when I heard those words, I just, I just started to weep up there on Mount Arbel. Jesus will never fail you. No matter how many times you fail him, he will never fail you. His love can't fail So never doubt his love. Never think you failed too much for him to rescue you. And you know, it was fitting that we ended our day. We went back down that mountain. And I'm just, my heart is full. I'm just overwhelmed with God's love. And the place we go to next is Magdala. Magdala is a recent discovery. 2007, they found it. They thought they had found it earlier, but things didn't match up. Now they know they found it. And uh, this is the synagogue they, they dug up uh, over there in Magdala. It's, you can see all the ruins there. There's houses. You see their fishing area because Magdala at that time, the sea was larger. It was a fishing village. Um, very small village. Only about 200 people lived there, which makes Mary Magdalene's story even more fascinating because here's a woman who had seven demons, the Bible says, and was not. It, uh, the Pharisee, she had a reputation. Remember when she was coming to wash Jesus' feet? with her tears. And what did the Pharisee say? He wouldn't let her do this if he knew what kind of a sinner this woman was. This is a woman who lived in a small town who everybody knew her. Everybody knew her failures. And so as we're coming down from Mount Arbel, I've just had that Bible study about how Jesus's love will never fail no matter how much you fail. We come, and this is a small synagogue too. And I think this is the place where Mary met Jesus. This is the place where the woman who had seven demons, I don't know if Jesus did the exorcism right here, but this is the place where she heard Jesus teach and she dared to hope that a woman who was a sinner like her could be forgiven and freed. And Jesus did. Jesus did, you know? So God taught me about his love, you know, that his love for me will never fail. And I tell you, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm sure that I'll struggle again someday with some things, but I, I came away with a different perspective on Jesus's love than I'd ever have before. My life, since I've come back from that understanding is so much more laid back. I, I don't sweat a whole lot of stuff, even my own failures. I just think, Lord, I know you love me and, 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 and I want to love you back. And it is so freeing just to, to rest in his love. And so, you know, if you struggle with that, you need to know Jesus' love will never fail you. Even when you're failing him, even when you're questioning him, even when you're calling him the source of evil in your life, his love will never fail you. Well, the second thing that the Lord put in my life was a renewed joy to fulfill God's call in my life. So these are the gates of hell. I didn't know there was a real place called the gates of hell, not until I went to Israel. And this is fascinating to me. So in Matthew 16, so right near where we are, I want to read some scripture to you. Now, I want to explain a little bit about the area here. This is Caesarea Philippi. 
That's uh, the gates of hell. There are three, the, the Greeks believe there were three gates of hell or gates to the underworld. Uh, one was in uh, Rome, one was here, and the other place is, I'm not remembering the other place where it was. I believe it was in Turkey somewhere. Um, so they believe that these were the three gates of the, to the underworld, to Hades. Okay, that's what the gates of hell are, the gates of Hades. It's, that's, they believe that. It was also the temple of the god Pan, uh, who was a goat. It was like a fawn type god. And so this is where they would come and worship him and believe that he was like the trickster. He was always trying to lead you, kind of like the Pied Piper, to the gates of the underworld, and then you would get trapped there. So they built a, so what do you do? You, you build a temple, you know, and worship him and hope he doesn't lead you there. So this is the big rock cliff that is cut into. That's actually a column from the Roman temple to Pan that's there. They had actually three other deities they worshiped there as well. Nemesis, uh, Nymphira, and I don't remember the third one. But, um, and then out of the gates of hell is a spring that comes out of it, a, 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 fl- a living water spring. And now it's, they've beautified it here and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, so the gates of hell. This big, huge cliff with this massive hole, um, and you should go much deeper. Now it's all filled in. Uh, nobody wanted to go to hell anymore, so they filled it in. So Jesus brings the disciples up here to be- get away. This is way up north, okay, to get away with him. And when verse 13 of chapter 16 in Matthew says, when Jesus was coming to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said unto them, well, whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed are you, Simon, Barjona, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Don't get too big for your britches. You didn't figure this out on your own. God revealed it to you. But here's the key. And I say unto you, and here's the part, don't get too big for your britches. You are Peter. The word there, Petros, means a small pebble. I didn't have any pictures of it. I thought I took some. But these cliffs, they erode. The whole ground for miles around it is just filled with these little tiny red pebbles everywhere. Everywhere. And this is where Jesus is telling Peter this. Peter, you're you're one of these. Don't think you're one of those. (laughs) You're one of these. You're one of these little guys, okay? And upon this rock, the cliff... I will build my church upon this rock of, of your confession of faith. That's what I'm, it's going to be built upon me. And he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What an object lesson. I, I was blown away. I didn't know any of this stuff about the place where Jesus said this stuff. And you know, what he's saying is, is that, you know, Jesus is explaining that, you know, the foundation is me. And, and as, as the pastor was sharing the message about this, you know, the Lord was speaking to me, saying, you're just a little pebble, a little piece of that broke off of, of the massive rock of living water that flows out by his spirit. You know, he doesn't need me to build his church. He created after Adam after he was done with everything else. It's not like he needed Adam's help, and he doesn't need mine. And you know what that does? That sure takes the pressure off, doesn't it? You know, he can get his job done. And while God doesn't need me for anything, he gives me the pleasure of being part of what he's doing. And that gave me such a renewed sense of joy in my calling, you know, uh, before the Lord. And and so it was kind of fitting that later on, the next day, we went to Gideon Springs. Now, if you want to hear the whole story, the significance for Gideon Springs, for Gideon's story to me personally, I would encourage you to get the message where I share my story of why I came here. It was a story of Gideon that convinced me the Lord wanted me to you know, apply for the position here. You know, Gideon wasn't a prophet, but he was the one that God wanted for the job. When the angel finds Gideon, he's a fearful young man, right? Hiding out in the wine press, you know, uh, I mean, hiding out, you know, uh, making a, a makeshift wine press in a place you normally wouldn't find it. But even though he was a fearful young man, God could use him. Gideon didn't think he was ready, but God wanted to work through him right then if, if Gideon would answer the call. And the Lord just reminded me. I mean, I wept as I'm there. I'm standing in a place where, you know, they were, you know, lit, you know remember the ones that were being weeded out of his army? If they, you know, if they just started drinking, you know, they, they could go home. But those that were kind of looking around, the ones that were fearful, the ones that were weak, those are the ones that God would use. 300 of them to destroy the entire Midianite army. And he did. I never need to be afraid of or question God's call because of my perceived inability. God has sent me to do what he's called me to do. And he'll work through me. You know, it's fascinating. You know, he came to, to Gideon and he said, there are people all around you who are oppressed, Gideon, and I want to rescue them. Will you go for me? 
And, and you look in your lives, wherever God has placed you, whatever ministry has put you in, whatever job he's put you in, whatever circle of influence he's put you in, there are oppressed people all around you. And God wants to rescue them. So he sends you and he sends me. So don't be afraid of God's call in your life. Be faithful. So later that day, we went here. And this just wrecked me. Um, this is the beach where Jesus restores Peter, they think. Um, it doesn't matter because it could be any one of these beaches. So uh, they gave us some time to just kind of spend with the Lord here. And I, I had, for whatever reason, I got up late that morning, couldn't have my devotion and had some time with the Lord. And I just recommitted myself to my calling. And uh, I grabbed two rocks that sounded alike. I felt like God wanted me to do this or looked alike, not sounded, they didn't speak. <laughs> that looked alike. And this is one of them. This is the one I threw into the Galilee. And I told the Lord, I said, okay, God, I, don't, I know you've called me to this. I'm not ever going to question it again. I'm not ever going to doubt it again. I said, the only way I will ever do that again is if I can find that rock that I threw into the sea. So I've got a little baggie that has the other one, its partner, to remind me. So if I ever think about it, I can be reminded and go, no, unless you get your scuba gear, you know. And if you can find out the exact one, then, you know, you got to finish the job. So, but that one is lying at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. So God really renewed my joy for my calling when I was there. Um, wow, it's 8 o'clock. Well... I'm going to shorten this story. This is the Elah Valley. This is where David fought Goliath. Isn't that cool? This is where David fought Goliath. So that little road we're, we're walking on is the brook. Now it's, in, it's, uh, it's very dry right now. They, in fact, they had some rain when we were there, and it's the first time they had rain in about uh, two months. So they're, they're actually going through a little bit of an arid period right now. So there's no brook right now. Um, so we walked. We had our Bible study here. Um, but that's the brook where, G, where he got his rocks from. That's the brook where David got his five smooth stones and one of them ended up killing Goliath is from that, that bed right there. I mean, not that, I don't know where in the, in the, in the brook he got it from, but there's rocks all, of the, all of, on, the, on the river bed or the brook bed. So there's no water right now, but that's where he went and he got those five smooth stones. And I've actually, uh, where'd they go? I've got a whole bag. So if there are any giants out there, I, I didn't know, I figured I might encounter more giants than David in my life. So I, got, I filled the whole thing with rocks. I gave one to each of my kids. So if they ever encounter a giant, I said, you can take care of them. Work for David. It can work for you. But I've got, I've got plenty of my rocks here. So, you know, any of you are over six foot five, don't get too close. <laughs> so, but you know, one of the things that, that fascinated me about that whole story, and you know the story, David comes to the battlefield and he sees, you know, that uh, everybody's afraid. He goes, I'll fight this guy. And he goes into Saul and, and, and he says to Saul, uh, the king, I mean, here's this kid saying to the king, he goes, you know, your servant, you know, uh, basically he tells him, you can't, you can't fight this guy. He's been a soldier trained from his youth and you're but a youth. You have no training and you're just a kid. He's been trained from, his, from being a kid. And, and David goes, no, 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 don't forget this, Saul. Let me list my qualifications. Your servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. So I went after him and I smote him. And I delivered it, the lamb, out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and I smote him. I mean, David's like, remember, and I struck him again. I hit him again. He didn't get up, you know, and I slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. But David said moreover, and he explains to Saul, I'm not boasting, Saul, about how great I am. He explains how it happened. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, I can't argue with that. Go, and the Lord be with you. But then he tried to give him his armor. And remember, it didn't work for David. He goes, I haven't tested these. I can't use these. So it says, David took everything, all the armor off, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. I mean, it, it tries to show us the absurdity of what he's about to do. And his sling was in his hand. And he starts walking towards Goliath. And, you know, Goliath starts taunting him. <laughs> this is an insult. You send kids out, you know. And David, he says to Goliath, this day will the Lord deliver you into my hand and I will smite you and take your head from you. And I will give your carcass to, uh, the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls there. Not just you, but all your comrades. They're going to be bird food. The birds at Megiddo, they're coming over, you know. And to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. 
And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so it says, therefore David ran, and he stood upon the Philistine, and after he, he struck him with the rock, and David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. What are a sling and a stone in the hands of an untrained shepherd? They were the loving gifts David gave to the Lord. With that, the Lord could do anything. And he wants the same from you and me. You can't look at your inability. See, David, he knew how this was going to end before it started. He knew how it was going to end. His mindset was in the right place. It isn't about what God can do. It's absurd to think that a youth could defeat a bear and a lion, but guess what? The Lord delivered them out into my hand. And so, yeah, it's absurd for me to go up against this Philistine, but if God wants me to do it, then it doesn't matter what skills I bring to the table. I've got, all I've got is a sling, and some, I picked up these stones in the brook, and I've got a shepherd's staff, and I offer them to you, Lord. Take me and my meager gifts and go slay a Philistine. And the truth is, with that, God could do anything, and he could do the same through you. So, last thing I want to show you. Can we play this video? This is the Wailing Wall. These are all Orthodox Jews. You see the different hats. The different hats symbolize what rabbi they're following. Some are Russian Orthodox. Some are more Eastern Orthodox. Some of them are Armenian. But they're all there. You know. they, the reason they bob is because they believe you should be praying with everything that's in you, not just with your mouth and, or with your heart, but everything that's in you. You worship the Lord with everything that's in you, so they, their whole body, they, they do that. Let's play, uh, play the next, next video. This is still the Western Wall, but it's inside. They've actually dug out. The, the, you have the entire Western Wall is intact. The, the ground that they're walking on is the actual ground Jesus walked on um, in his day. Um, and this is where the women come. They, they can also go to the right of the Wailing Wall, or they can come in here. There's some men who come in here, but it's mostly ladies. And that's our tour guide she's explaining to us. But as you can see them, what they do is they, they get as close to the wall as possible because they believe God's presence is still on the other side. The Shekinah glory of God, pardon me, they believe is still on the other side. And so they get as close as they can possibly get because they want to be close to God. And you know, I was at this moment as I'm watching, there's a woman there and uh, I don't want to point her out. Doesn't, that's not important. But she begins to weep. I mean, really just begins to sob. And I could tell she's going through something. And she's just pressing her hand hard against the wall. And I'm obviously I'm videotaping it from this spot. And I'm just with everything in me, I'm wanting to shout, he's not over there. <laughs> he's not over there. He's in here. He's in here. And my heart just broke for them. I thought, you know, they have a lot of zeal, but it's without knowledge. They, they, have, a, they have a lot of desire to know God, but they, they're not, they're not going to find him because they're looking in the wrong place. And, and, you know, I think this is a great place to kind of close tonight because, you know, all of us need to go out and tell others about the Jesus who lives inside us. You know, people are trying to find God everywhere, aren't they? You know, I mean, they're trying to find life everywhere. They're trying to find answers everywhere. And someday the Bible says that the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to provide answers in the whole world, not the whole world, but much of the world is going to go, he's our man. We don't need a man. We've already found him. And he's living inside our hearts. And so my exhortation to you tonight is, you know, there's people like this all around who need Jesus and who are looking for something. Go give them Jesus, amen? amen. You know, tell them about the God who lives inside of you because, you know, you have a life and you can offer it to them. Lord, we thank you so much for your love and we thank you so much for um, the beautiful truths you've uh, shared through your word that we can uh, experience through photos and whatnot and videos and, and my personal testimony. That's all wonderful, Lord, but, but all it stems from your word. And so we thank you for your word tonight and we love you and we bless you. Help us, give us boldness to go out and to share our faith with others because you are alive. You are not dead. He is not here. He is risen. And Lord, help us to share that. Fill us with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.